These are the faces of survivors. <laughs> Not only did they survive two years living under ISIL, they risk everything to escape it. Since the onset of the battle to liberate Mosul from ISIL, the coalition of forces from the Iraqi military, Kurdish Peshmerga and small militant groups have known the fight would be long and difficult. Aid agencies immediately prepared for the arrival of hundreds of thousands of refugees expected to flee the fighting. We visited Zelikan camp, northeast of Mosul, shortly after it opened. At the time, there were heavy clashes in the area, and the camp was filling up fast. The United Nations has called for a pause in the fighting to deal with the mounting humanitarian needs. It says this fight for Mosul could produce the largest and most complex humanitarian effort this year. Despite being free from ISIL's grip, few refugees at the camp wanted to talk to us. These people still live in fear, fear that ISIL would see their faces, hear their voices, and kill their relatives who were still in ISIL-controlled areas. From the city, there were reports of mass murders, entire families being used as human shields, bridges rigged with explosives, even the use of chemical weapons. Ahmed ended up at the camp after struggling against the odds. For days, Ahmed was trapped in the rubble of his destroyed house with a massive wound on his leg. Then, the fighting stopped, and security forces were able to bring him to this camp. Upon arriving at a camp, people are registered and go through security screening to ensure they are not ISIL militants. Once cleared, they're assigned a tent and given relief supplies. So this is the typical tent setup that you see in most refugee camps where the new refugees are placed. In this case, uh, they are given a small gas canister here so they can do some amount of cooking, some uh, plastic basins, wash basins so they can wash their dishes as well as some clothes. Now here is sort of the living, uh, sleeping area. Uh, from what I understand, about 12 people can live in this space. Uh, they are given mattresses, in this case two, uh, for sleeping and for for sitting on during the day. Uh, all these tents are wind and rain uh, proof so uh, they can stop the weather elements from actually affecting the people and you'll also see here uh, there is electricity uh, available for these tents. But if you come back here, this is the interesting part. Back here is another compartment which uh, many people use as somewhat of a kitchen as well as a play area for the children. Now this may not be ideal circumstances, but when you're escaping war and trying to save the life of yourself and your children, most people don't mind. First aid and psychological help are also available to those who have suffered physical or mental trauma. Yet while aid agencies are doing what they can to accommodate large groups of displaced people, their resources are scarce. Worst case scenario you know, is that upwards of 1.2 million people might be displaced, and that's in Mosul alone. Uh, the people that you see here are from the outskirts and villages surrounding the area. While we're prepared to do you know, what we've committed to, for our part of the humanitarian response, um, we're only 50% funded. So uh, it's, a, it's a common challenge, I think, across the board. Debega refugee camp outside the regional capital of Erbil was set up when ISIL entered the area back in 2014. More than 36,000 people have been through this camp, 
and many continue to arrive daily, risking everything to make the dangerous escape. ISIL have used snipers and rocket fire and littered Mosul with landmines to disrupt coalition advances and stop residents from fleeing. Ibrahim Hussein Mohammed knows the risks all too well. Throughout the camp, stories like this are common. According to charity organizations, this assault on Mosul puts upwards of 600,000 children at risk. And they're all vulnerable to the same things as adults, rape, torture and murder. Since ISIL captured the area, children have endured unspeakable pain, including the loss of family members. Nazar Al-Farrar, a former police officer, invited us into the container he and his family have been sharing with his brother's four children. Nazar assumed responsibility for his brother's children after their mother disappeared. Their village has now been liberated, but Nazar has no way of supporting his now extended family if he leaves the camp. Despite the progress of the campaign against ISIL, officials say many families are choosing to stay at refugee camps, placing more pressure on resources as new people arrive. A lot of people here whose villages haven't, have been liberated like a year ago, but they don't want to go by because they don't have the basic services in their cities. Their houses have been destroyed. They don't have even this, the, the, the simplest sanitation facilities. Well, much of the Mosul area has been liberated. It will take weeks, if not months, to restore the necessary services to make them livable again, leaving aid agencies planning well into the future. Jamel Jasmine and his family fled the central Iraqi city of Fallujah in 2013. Iraqi security forces pushed ISIL out of Fallujah in June 2016, but few of the basic services there have been restored. بس هنا ايجار والله دزنا صور متاذيه
Jamal and many others say they're frustrated with what they see as a lack of government support. Over the years, Iraqis have experienced some of the world's worst fighting. They have suffered some of the worst personal losses. Many have fallen into despair. In 2014, the UNHCR reported that almost 2 million Iraqis were displaced from their homes. The battle to retake Mosul is likely to displace another million. Yet despite the Iraqi people's unrelenting struggles, the world is also witnessing their strength. To see the resilience and the strength in, in all of these individuals, um, they're survivors. And they've been surviving for two years. It's, it's been incredibly humbling. After everything they've been through, many have also kept their dignity intact. <laughs> And they all hope that one day, this will prove greater than war. For Assignment Asia, I'm Natalie Carney in Northern Iraq.